Hey, welcome to Life Point Church. How's everybody doing today? There we go. Hey, it's great to see all of you here today. My name is Jordan, and I get to serve here as one of our pastors on staff, and we're so glad that you're here today. And um, if you are new or visiting, if it's your first time with us, like Pastor Bo mentioned, we want to invite you to um, text the letters LPC to the number 31996, and uh, we want to help just respond to that and help give you um, just some simple next steps. Or there's a, um, if you're a, you know, just an old-fashioned pen and paper type person, um, there's a, a paper um, connection card in the seat back in front of you that you can fill out as well. But we're so glad uh, that you're here today and we're excited to connect with you. Hey, I wanted to thank everybody before we get going today. Thank you again. Um, like we say every week, thank you so much for your giving and for your generosity. And Pastor Mike, if you weren't here last week, Pastor Mike announced some big news. Um, we are going to be launching our Austin P State University campus this fall. <laughs> And my wife and I will get the privilege uh, and honor of leading that campus over there. So we are so excited for that. And your giving and your generosity uh, makes a way for us to be able to do that. So thank you so much for giving um, towards this. Also, if you didn't have an opportunity last week to scan um, this QR code that's about to come up on the screen, um, if you would go ahead and just scan this QR code, if you are interested in being a part of uh, helping us launch um, our campus down there at the college, um, or if you'd just like to receive some more information, um, you can do that by scanning that um, QR code and, and fill that out. And um, we, we'll have people follow up with you and just give you um, whatever information on that you're looking for. But I just want to challenge you today that um, if you're a college student, if you are a young adult, if you are married with no kids, um, because at this campus we won't be offering kid point, or if you're an empty nester, or I gotta be careful with this one, if you're an older, wiser, more experienced in life person, <laughs> hey, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm just being careful there now. Come on now, I wanna get in trouble. Um, or if you just live in the downtown area, we would love to have you join us um, at this campus. And we're going to be launching that campus on September 19th. And um, so whatever the case, it's going to be same, same uh, message, same everything is here over there, um, except um, Kid, Kid Point won't be offered over there. But I just feel like this is such a fitting time to launch a campus while we're in the book of Acts. Come on, I just feel like this is book of Acts type stuff, man. How many people know that, come on, we're going to take ground for the kingdom in Jesus' name. So I'm excited. Would you pray for us as we um, continue to move towards the launch of this campus? God is going to do incredible things um, in the lives of um, those that live downtown and, and those on Austin Peace campus. And so we're, we're really excited about that. Hey, we are continuing today in our Book of Acts series. How many people are enjoying the Book of Acts? Man. And we're picking up um, in this series, and we're going to be actually starting on uh, Acts chapter 4 today. And I love the book of Acts. I, I have a lot of different favorite different books of the Bible, as I'm sure many of you do. But, but I love the book of Acts. I love the book of Acts. And I just find it interesting that, that the book of Acts is called Acts. And actually, in the original Greek language, Acts, it, this book is called the Acts of the Apostles. And that word acts, actually in the, in the original Greek language, it means deeds or practice. I'm going to go somewhere with this. I just find that interesting and very challenging for us too. Because it, this book is not called the thoughts of the apostles. Or the hopes and wishes of the apostles. Or the let's just sit around and talk about it book of apostles. It's called the Acts of the Apostles, or how I like to think of this book. This is a book of action. Come on, somebody. How many people know as followers of Jesus, we are called to action? Come on now. And so this book, the early church believed so deeply in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that it caused them to act in some pretty radical ways. And I believe that this text is going to push us and challenge us a little bit in that way too. Are you, are you okay to be pushed and challenged? Okay, we, today's message ain't fluffy. They're never fluffy here, but you know what I'm saying? I'm just going to make that, say that up front. This, this, is, this is a challenging message. And I, I pray today that this text pushes us and challenges us in some area of our lives as believers. Can somebody say amen? 
All right, it's going to be good. Get ready. Did you bring a Bible to church today? Did you bring something to take notes with to church today? You should always bring a Bible to church, okay? Um, if you have a paper Bible, that's great. Make sure you have that too. If your Bible glows, if you got to charge your Bible, that's okay too. It's a joke, but <laughs> just make sure whatever you do, you have the Word of God. Come on, I'm telling you right now, this book that we're about to dive into is not a book that is outdated. This is not a book of just random stories. This is the word of the living God, and this book has the power to transform and change our lives. Matter of fact, Hebrews says that the word of God is powerful and active. Come on, it's alive and active. This word transforms us and changes us, and I'm believing today that we're not just going to be hearers of the word. Come on, somebody, we're going to be doers of the word. You can stay verbally engaged however you want. You can say amen. Come on now. So I'm excited for today. Um, just to give you a recap before we jump into to Acts chapter 4, the last couple of weeks, um, we've been following along in this, this story about Peter and John healing this crippled man. And if you remember, Peter and John, they were just headed up to prayer. You know what I'm talking They were just headed up for, for Tuesday prayer at 9 a.m. By the way, we have Tuesday prayer here at church uh, every Tuesday at 9 a.m. right here in the building. We stream it online. So if you want to join us for prayer at 9 a.m. on Tuesdays and you have the availability to do that, you should do that. But Peter and John were heading up to the, to the temple for the time of prayer when they encountered this, this man who had been crippled from birth. And he, and he begged Peter and John for money. And Peter and John said, we don't have any money, but what we do have, we give to you in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And this man was miraculously healed. And, and the Bible says that people were astounded. And it says that they were actually filled with wonder and amazement. And we heard Pastor Mike teach a message a couple weeks ago that God is a, a God that still does miracles. How many people believe that today? We serve a God that still does miracles. Then last week, Pastor Mike taught us in verses 11 through 26 when Peter spoke up. It really, in his second speech, he addressed the crowd and explained to them why and how this man was healed. And Peter, being a good follower of Jesus, pointed them back to Jesus. And this story continues in our message today in Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 1. And we see Peter here give his, give his third speech so far in the book of Acts, and we find Peter and John in, in, in a pretty hot situation. So this, it's about to get good. So everybody just say, it's about to get good. Just say, it's about to get, it's about to get good. All right. The title of my message today is, In Spite of Opposition, We Must Share the Gospel. I told you today, we ain't playing games. We, just, we ain't playing games, Okay. In spite of opposition, we must share the gospel. We pick up reading today in Acts chapter 4, verse 1. If you follow along with me in your Bible, um, as I read the text today, and then we're going to go back through and we're going to walk through it together. So Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it says this. It says, and as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, a.k.a. the haters, man, the haters, I'm drinking haterade. I got Christian jokes all day here, okay? We just, saying. And it says, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. It says, they arrested them and they put them in custody until the next day for it was already evening. Number four, or verse four, you need to circle this word, you need to underline this word, but, but. Many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to 5,000. Verse 5, on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power? Or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, this is another part of the text you need to underline, okay? You need to underline it. You need to highlight it. Do whatever you can here to, to bring attention to this. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, 
Come on, somebody. Said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you. Peter's taking shots here, okay? He's going for the jugular here. He's just going for it. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The first thing I want to point out in our text today, we're going to just get going into this real quick. The first thing I want to point out in our text today is this, that there is a cost to sharing the gospel, but the cost is worth it. I'm going to say that again. There is a cost to sharing the gospel, but the cost is worth it. Starting in verse 1, looking back there, Acts 4, verse 1, it says, And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and they put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. So Peter and John here in verse 1 are speaking to the people about the resurrected Jesus. And this text says that the priest... The captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon Peter, the religious people, came upon Peter and John because they were greatly annoyed at what they were saying. Now, Peter and John were just speaking before, you know, these thousands of people in this courtyard, and, and now they have the attention of a lot of very important Jewish officials. And I just want to break these, just kind of highlight who these people are, because maybe if you're not familiar with church or, you know, th this story at all, I just want to kind of familiarize your, you with who these people are. The priests were the officials that were responsible for things such as sacrifices, Jewish festivals, and other various rituals in the temple. And the captain of the temple was the official that was in charge of all the temple affairs. So his job was to keep the peace. So he would have been considered like, basically like the, like the police of the temple. So he took his job very seriously. And so what Peter and John were saying was a serious threat to him keeping order in the temple. And the Sadducees were members of the priestly family, and, and their particular theology was that they did not believe in the resurrection or in miracles. So, so this definitely got their attention. So now the mood has totally shifted have you ever been in just a really exciting atmosphere before? I mean, we just saw Peter and John just saw thousands of people get saved. Have you ever been in a place before and just, somebody put a damper on the parade? You know what I'm talking about? Somebody just, somebody just put a damper on things. Well, these religious officials show up and they basically, this whole, the whole mood of this text swings here. And this is interesting to me because up until now, we've actually seen the church flourishing and growing and experiencing favor so this is actually the first time we see the church and the apostles facing adversity for sharing the message of Jesus. However, now instead of being welcomed and embraced because of what Peter and John were saying by teaching the people about the resurrection of Jesus and sharing the gospel with people, they got tossed in jail. How's that for just, you know, a, a great day? They got thrown in jail for sharing the gospel. And I just want to remind some Christians today and remind us today as believers that like Peter and John, we carry the greatest message on planet earth and it's called the gospel. And let me define the gospel for you if you're newer to church or maybe you aren't familiar with the, what the term gospel means. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, it's not just good news, it's the best news. I'm telling you, there's a lot of real bad news in our world today. But how many people know, come on somebody, that we carry not just good news, we carry the best news with us as followers of Jesus. 
that Jesus took on the sins for all of humanity, died in our place, canceled the penalty of sin and death on our behalf, and now because of that, we have forgiveness of sins and new life in Christ, free of guilt and shame and condemnation and the sting of death. Come on, somebody. This gospel isn't just good news. It's great news. So yes, we have the greatest message on planet Earth, and we're called to get this message out. I don't know if you know this or not, but we are called to get this message out to as many people as we possibly can. But as we, as we see from these passages, sharing this message is not always popular, and it's not always wanted. And this message, like we just saw in this text, it will disrupt the norm. Sharing the gospel will cost you something. Some of us might be thinking right now, dang, why did I come to church today? Because this is a hard message to hear, and it's not always a popular one to preach. Some of us like following Jesus because of all that it has to offer us, because of all the comfort that it has to offer us. But maybe we've never considered actually what following Jesus might cost us. And there are a lot of people that think following Jesus is comfortable and that Jesus called us to comfort. But I'm here to tell you today that Jesus did not call us as followers of Jesus. Yes, following Jesus is great. And there is so much that we're thankful for as followers of Jesus. And there's so many great things that we get as followers of Jesus. But Jesus actually didn't call you and I to comfort Matter of fact, he says that we are called to give up our lives. We're called to die to ourselves for his sake. And there are Christians and there are pastors around the world today that are being killed and are being persecuted. Pastor Mike talked about this last week for spreading this message. In some places in the world, it is illegal to share the gospel. It is illegal to say the name of Jesus How many people you're thankful today, come on, that we can gather together as a body of believers in a place like this and not be in fear of what it might cost us. But I think is in our Western Christianity, we take stuff like that for granted. But there are people around the world right now that are losing their very lives. Churches in parts of the world are being burnt to the ground. Christians are losing their lives. Pastors are being persecuted and murdered for the gospel. We're living in a day and age where sharing the gospel here in the United States of America could one day become a form of hate speech. Sharing this message will always cost you something. Now listen to me. It might not cost you jail time or your life, but it might cost you your popularity. It might cost you some friends. It might cost you your comfort. It might cost you your time. You might have some family disown you or not want to talk to you. Your coworker might think you're weird. It might cost you not getting that promotion. I don't know what the gospel could cost you. I don't know what sharing the gospel might cost you, but there's a cost to sharing this message. Jesus actually warned us in the foretelling of persecution to come in Luke chapter 21 Verse 10 through 19, he says this. He says, and then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilence. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. And this will be your opportunity to bear witness. Verse 14, settle in your minds, therefore, not to meditate beforehand on how to answer, for I will give you a mouth of wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair on your head will perish. By endurance, you will gain your lives. How's that for an encouraging verse at 930 in the morning? (laughs) There's a cost to sharing the gospel. There's a cost to living for this message. 
But I also wanted to remind you that just like there is a cost to sharing this gospel, I wanted to remind us today that as believers and followers of Jesus, the cost of sharing this message is worth it. The cost of sharing this message is worth it. Look at verse 4. It says, but many of those who heard the word believed. And the number of men came to about 5,000. Peter and John were thrown in jail for sharing the gospel, but 5,000 people, probably way more than that, were saved and believed. Man, how is that for a great evangelism, you know, day out, just sharing the gospel? 5,000, I don't know if you've ever been, but 5,000, we read over stuff like this and we just think it's just normal. It is not normal to see 5,000 people at one time come to believe in Christ. And Peter and John see 5,000 people saved and believe the word of God. Man, I'm sure Peter and John were probably sitting in prison going, man, this, was, this ain't the way we hoped it would turn out and, th- and this is kind of a bummer, but man, we just saw 5,000 people saved, believe the word and be saved. I remember moving to Oregon. I moved to um, the Portland, Oregon area in 2010. Shout out to our Oregonians that watch online, but I moved out to Oregon in 2010 to help plant a church with a group of people. And um, if you know anything about Oregon or the Portland area, it's, 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 I believe it still ranks up there as one of the most unchurched areas in the nation. And so we kind of parachuted into this area. We didn't really know anybody. We just, we just felt like God was calling us um, to move to a difficult area and, and share the gospel and start a church. And so we, I packed up my little tiny Honda Accord. I was single at the time, okay, so everything that I owned just fit in totes, and I just, you know, was able to just fit them in my car, and so I packed up everything in 2010 and moved um, west to Portland to to help be a part of starting this church, and one of our first, within our first year there, um, we had our first Easter service coming up, and if, if, you know, if you're familiar with church life at all, Easter is is a big deal in, in church life, and so we wanted to invite as many people on Easter as we possibly could, and so we um, got our teams together, and we had these invite cards um, that, that invited people to our, our Sunday service. And, and so we, we canvassed neighborhoods. We, we printed out maps of the neighborhoods in our areas, and each team kind of took a, a certain part of town. And we canvassed neighborhoods, and we handed out these invites, and, and people would ask us, why in the world are you doing this? And we would just say, man, just we're doing this because... God loves you, and we just want to invite you to church, and it's, you know, it's going to be a great time. And some people, you know, we got to go further than that. We got to share the gospel with some people, and so it was really cool. It was just incredible. Just, we just blitzed these neighborhoods. Well, on these invite cards was my cell phone number, my personal cell phone number, because we didn't have a church office at the time. So your boy here was the church office. Okay, I was the church admin, all right? And so my, my personal cell phone number was on all these invite cards. And so we're handing out, I don't know how many we handed out, hundreds, probably thousands. I don't even know. But we just, we went everywhere, hang, doing all kinds of stuff. So my number's out everywhere. I don't know if any of y'all would feel comfortable doing that if we just threw your name, you know, your name and number up there on the screen. You know what I mean? It, it's just, so my number was out on, on everything. And I was in a friend's wedding one weekend, and we had just canvassed an area, you know, spent a, a couple hours one morning just getting the word out and inviting people and all that stuff and walking neighborhoods. And um, I was in a friend's wedding that night and my, my cell phone was in my pocket while I was up there on stage. And so my cell phone started buzzing. And, you know, of course, right in the middle of the ceremony, I can't answer it. So I let it go to voicemail. And so I get outside of this wedding and it's a voicemail from, uh, a, I'm going to keep this real PG here. You know what I'm saying? Um, it was from a guy that was very upset that received one of our invite cards to church. He was, he was not happy to say the least. Um, so I got the phone up to my ear like this, and this guy called me every name in the book. Um, it doesn't stop there. He threatened my life. He threatened my family's life. He threatened to show up at this event that we were going to do and do some pretty serious damage to people at our event. And we had to get the cops involved and it was, it was pretty scary. I don't know if you've ever been, you listen to somebody threaten your life on the other end of the phone. You know what I mean? Maybe you have, maybe there's people in the room, but, but it's kind of a scary thing. So I'm listening to this guy and he's just, he is fuming mad, furious. And so, you know, in that moment, it's like, oh my gosh, like fear just overtakes you. And it's like, you know, this is, this is crazy. So we need to get cops involved and they had to show up all this stuff. And I, and I was thinking about this. 
you know, this, this happened and it was not great to be yelled at and, you know, have your life be threatened. But thinking back on this, I was thankful that we did this. I was thankful that we were bold enough to go out into our community and invite people to church because we saw hundreds of people come to church on that Easter and many people gave their lives to Christ. And, and listen, church, I know that culture is changing and new laws might be passed, but we must continue to share the gospel no matter the cost because God is still moving and lives are still being changed and people need to hear the message that we have. And yes, we're gonna encounter opposition and pushback, but Jesus said, I will build my church. Come on, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So we're gonna open more campuses and we're gonna plant more churches and we're gonna reach more people and we're gonna see thousands of people come to know Christ and we're going to see more marriages restored and addicts set free. And in spite of all of the opposition that we might face, the cost of it is worth it for people to know Jesus. Church, this message is too important for us not to get out to our world. So what do we do? Where do we go from here? Because it's easy to clap at that. But it's harder to walk outside of these doors and live that out. So what do we do? I think the second thing we see in this text, and I want to point out to us, point number two, is we have to be bold and share the gospel. I told you this one would be fluffy. I'm just saying. Be bold and share the gospel. Verse number five, verse five through ten, it says this. It says, on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who are of the high priestly family. Now Peter and John are standing, they get arrested, they get put in jail. The next day, now they're brought before this Jewish high court, which at the time consisted of 71 members. And the rulers at the time were the leaders of the high priestly class, the elders which are the senior official, officials and members of the Jewish elite, the scribes who were specialists in the law, Annas the high priest at the time, and Caiaphas, who, by the way, would have been present at the trial of Jesus. So all these people, in some way, would have been responsible for the death of Jesus. So Peter and John have to know that this moment could cost them their lives. And I love what it says in, in verse 7 here. It says, and they, and they set them in their midst, which was a huge power play on their part. What, the, what this Jewish court now is trying to do is they're trying to intimidate Peter and John here. This was just intimidation right here. It set them right in the middle. And it says they inquired by what power or by what name did you do this? Just a, a side note, notice that they were originally arrested for sharing about the resurrection and teaching people about the resurrected Jesus. So they were originally arrested for what they were saying. Now they are being questioned based on their action. And I believe in the same way that Peter and John are questioned about their action, actions I believe that in the same way, we should live our lives as followers of Jesus, where people ask us similar questions based on our actions. Why do you do what you do? Why do you love people the way you love people? Who are you doing this for? Why are you doing this? Who, why do you serve the way you serve, like on serve day coming up on July 10th, which all of us should be involved in when it's 400 degrees outside, but we're serving our community and people will look at us and they will wonder, why are you doing this? And I just believe this. I believe that we should live our lives in such a way as Christ followers in a way that people notice something different about us. I'll take it a step further. Our actions, come on church, should always be a louder witness than our words. Our actions should always be a louder witness than our words. Or do we live such safe lives that no one around us would know whether we follow Jesus or not? 
And I think that's a good question to test yourself with. Do people in my life know that I follow Jesus based on the way that I live? Or do I just blend in with the rest of the world around us? Come on, church, I'm here to tell you today, if you are saved, if you've put your faith in Jesus, we are not called to blend in. We are called to stand out in Jesus' name. People should look at our lives. People should look at you. Have you ever had somebody look at you before and cock their head to the side like that? Not in a weird way. Like, not because, don't be weird. Don't, don't be weird in the name of Jesus. You know what I'm saying? There's some weird stuff going on. Don't, don't do that. But people should look at us differently because we're living differently. Because the culture's going one way, but as followers of Jesus, we're saying we're called to live a different way. And I'm telling you right now, based on the way that we live our lives, come on, people are attracted to that. People look at that and they say, whatever you have, I just think people should look at us and say, whatever you have, I want that. Because in a world that has gone chaotic and has gone array, how many people know that as Christ followers, we should be people that are filled with more peace right now, even in the midst of this? So people should look at our lives and they should see something different about us. I love Peter's response here to this question. And this is where it gets good. And this is where I want to challenge us big time today. It says this, it says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Come on, it's about, it's about to get good. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today, Concerning a good deed done to a crippled man by what, may, what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing for you well. I love how Peter, how it says Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what it doesn't say? It doesn't say Peter filled with the latest news. It doesn't say Peter filled with the latest political rant. It doesn't say Peter filled with his own opinions. It says Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Can I remind you, church, today that what you're full of will come out of you? That was for the next two services. That one for y'all. I'm just, I'm just saying. But what you're full of will come out. So that's why we need to be a people that are filled with the things of God. Because when the pressure comes in from this world and things are going crazy, when the pressure comes on, come on, what's on the inside of you will come out of you. So it says, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke is drawing our attention. I, the writer of, of Acts here, I think, is just doing... He's, he's saying this for a reason, and, I, and I'm, I'm wanting to sit on this. I know this seems kind of insignificant, and we just, we just read it, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. We, just, we might just read over something like that. But Luke is actually drawing our attention to something really important here. Because if you remember, Peter just a few verses ago wouldn't even confess Jesus in front of a middle school girl around a campfire. I don't know if that girl was in middle school. We just know she was a young girl. I'm just saying. I'm just trying to make it. But Peter, in Matthew 26, he wouldn't even confess Jesus to this little girl. And now Peter responds and he proclaims Christ with no fear, even in the face of potential death. How? Because Peter was in front of the little girl. He was alone. But now that Jesus was crucified and the Holy Spirit had been poured out, he wasn't alone. The Spirit of the living God, come on, was on the inside of Peter. And the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in this moment is what emboldened and empowered Peter to proclaim this message. And this is a powerful reality for us as believers. And I want you to hear this today. Because the same spirit that empowered Peter and John to share the gospel before the council in the face of possible death is the same Holy Spirit that will empower you and I to boldly share this message in the face of adversity. Luke chapter 12, verses 11 through 12 says this, And when they bring you before synagogues and rulers and authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself. Or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. 
Now hear me this morning. You might not be brought before rulers or authorities to share the good news of Jesus, but hear me today. Many of you have friends and you have coworkers and neighbors that need to hear this message. And you might not feel like you have the words to say, what if they reject me? What if they think I'm weird? What if I sound dumb? But I'm here to remind you today that you have the power of the Holy Spirit alive on the inside of you that will give you the words to speak when you need them. Listen, church, God wants to use us and God wants to use you just like he used Peter and John to boldly share the gospel. And God might be asking you to start a small group with your neighbors that don't know God or with your coworkers at lunch, or maybe God is pushing you to share the gospel with somebody in your life. And I feel like sometimes we're waiting on a feeling to feel ready to be used by God. Sometimes we're waiting on a feeling to feel ready to be used by God. But sometimes we need to stop waiting on a feeling to feel ready to tell someone about Jesus and be used by God. And we just need to trust that the Holy Spirit is with us to boldly share the good news wherever we go. So the next time you step onto your workplace and onto your school campus, on post, in your neighborhood, you can walk around with confidence. Come on, church, and know that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. You can walk into any situation and carry this message anywhere because we have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Can I just challenge us? God did not save us to sit in a holy huddle and sing songs until Jesus comes back. God saved us to use us to carry this message to as many people as possible. Church, hear me today. We have a mandate from heaven to get this message out to as many people as we possibly can. God's given us a mandate and God wants to use us, his church, to get this message out. And we have to boldly proclaim this message no matter what. Because Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only way. Verse 11, it says that this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And he says this in verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Peter ends his speech here by quoting uh, a verse from the Old Testament, which was a popular verse at that time um, in early Christian thinking regarding the life, death, and burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And they saw this as a reference. They used this, this, ter- this verse to reference it as, you know, what would happen to the coming Messiah. And in Psalm, this king who, who wrote this verse was rejected by people, but accepted and made victorious by God. In Psalm 118, 22, it says this, that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And just to Teach for just a second on what this word cornerstone means. A cornerstone is the stone that you begin building a building with, and it determines the direction and everything else is built upon this stone. The cornerstone is the most important part of a building. It sets everything else in order, and builders who construct a building reject a stone if they regard it as unusable, such as if it was, if it was cut improperly or if it doesn't fit the specific position in the wall where it was intended to fit. And Peter is telling this Jewish council that you guys were the builders and you were responsible for building Israel, this nation of the people of God, and you rejected the very thing that we needed. And he goes on to say, but don't worry, the stone that you rejected, God raised him up and he's here, and he's alive, and he's saving people, and he's healing people just like this man that you see in front of you. In other words, Peter is telling them, you rejected the perfect way, the only way. He's what we build our lives on now. You rejected him, but God chose him, and I just feel like this is our world today. We're trying everything else to fix the brokenness, to fix ourselves when only Jesus can fix the brokenness. And Peter and John were willing to risk their lives and they go all in on this and they believe that this was something worth giving their lives for and dying for. Can I tell you something, church? Our world does not need 
a new big thing. Our world does not need a new political system. Our, our world is in desperate need of one thing. The only thing that can fix hurting, broken humanity is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in, unless we're building our lives on him, we're wasting our time. Only Jesus, only Jesus is able to save. And I would ask you this question today as we close, what cost are you willing to pay for people to know the gospel? What cost are you willing to pay for people to know this truth? That Jesus is alive today and he wants to heal people and he wants to save people. Listen, church, the only hope for lost and broken humanity is Jesus and we have this message, and we cannot fail to tell people about it. I once heard someone say that knowing the message of the gospel and not telling someone about it is like having the cure for cancer and not sharing it. We have a message that we have to get out. We have to get this message out. May we be bold risk takers, church, to get this message out to as many people as possible. God didn't put you where you are today on accident. God didn't put you in that job you're in today on accident. God didn't put you in that neighborhood that you're in next to that person that needs to know God on accident. And I'm not by any means saying that you shout at them, that you yell at them, that you do anything that would, because that's not the way. That is not the way that we share the good news. That is not the God that we serve. But God puts you where you are today for a purpose and for a reason. And God wants to use you to declare this message boldly to the people around you. So I want to challenge us today. And I pray that this week, my prayer is I was just preparing this week and praying over this message. I was just praying that when you walk out of this place, that the Holy Spirit is going to disrupt your lives in a good way. That God's going to bring people in your lives through divine appointment. That God's going to bring people into your world. And some of you are here today and you have people right now that need to hear this message. And maybe you haven't felt ready enough or you, you felt like, man, what if I sound dumb? What if I say something to them and it just doesn't come out right? You're not the one that does the saving. You're not the one that does the saving. Jesus is the one that does the saving. And can I just tell you, there'll, there'll never come a point in time where you'll feel ready enough or you'll feel like you know enough. But man, we just need to trust that the Holy Spirit is in us and God wants to use you. I love coming to church on Sundays and I love that we get to gather together like this as a group of believers and we get to lift up the name of Jesus. But when you leave these four walls today, is, is this the topic of conversation? You know, when people ask you, questions about your life when people wonder hey you know how are you doing in the midst of all this what, what's keeping you together and just everything that's going on in our world today that we just don't point them to another thing our world today this doesn't need another thing our world today just doesn't need well, do, well just do this well just do no we need to be bold enough to say have you ever met jesus Jesus is the one that has, has been doing this in my life. He's the one that's transformed me and changed my life. And I want to just share that. Is it okay if I share that with you? And you, and you might not get it all right. You, the words might sound weird coming out of your mouth. But I just want to challenge you this week to live your life in such a way that the Holy Spirit could disrupt your regularly scheduled program. To share the gospel with somebody. You have something. I love that 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 story we heard of Peter and John saying, man, I don't have silver or gold. I can't offer you that. We, look, our world thinks they need one thing, but what we need is Jesus. What our world needs is Jesus, and God has called you to be an ambassador. We are called ministers of reconciliation. The Bible says in 1st or 2nd Corinthians that we, Paul says we are called to, to cry out to people, come back to God. Because only God can heal the brokenness. Only God can heal the hurt that our world is facing right now. And people are depending on you to share this message with them. And so I pray this week that God just gets all up in your business. You know what I'm saying? And just interrupts your day 
maybe at the office when a coworker comes in and they wanna sit and they wanna vent, to say, hey, can I pray with you? Can I share something with you? Or maybe on your school campus coming up this fall or wherever the Lord takes you during this week, hey, hey can I, I know that's going on in your life, but can I, can I tell you about this? And trust that the Holy Spirit is at work. Romans says that I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God. Church, when we share the gospel with people, we aren't just sharing words. It's the power of God at work in people's lives to transform them and to change them. And I just believe that God wants to use you this week to declare his goodness to people, not in a mean way or a hateful way, but to declare God's goodness in someone's life. God wants to use you today wherever you're at. In Jesus' name, come on, can we give God a big shout of praise today? I wanna pray really quick before we go. I wanna pray because I was thinking about how to end this message and I know maybe there's somebody here today that maybe you've never put your faith in Jesus. Or maybe you have and you've since walked the other way and you've been living, trying to build your life. The cornerstone is the perfect way And even as followers of Jesus, even as followers of Christ, we reject God and say, I can do it my own way. I sit down with a lot of people during the week and our pastoral team does and we counsel people and help people. And that's one of the first questions I always ask people is what what are, people will say, my my marriage is going crazy, my life is going crazy, everything's going this way. And I always say, how is your, how's your relationship with the Lord? What are you building your life upon? And I just wanna call some of us back. Maybe you're a Christian and you're here today and you know Jesus, but you've been knowingly rejecting him by building your life on something else. And I wanna call us back today to that. I wanna draw our attention back to the goodness of God. It's only through him that we can be saved. It's only through him that we receive salvation, the power to live this life out as overcomers and victorious in Jesus' name. So if that's you and you're here, nobody's looking around really quick, I wanna pray. I know we went a little bit over time, but I just wanna pray for some people. If you're here today and you would say, hey, I need, I wanna, I wanna confess Jesus is Lord of my life. I've never done it before. Maybe you have in the past, and maybe you're saying, man, I've walked away, I've turned my back, I've, I've just gone in a, in a different direction. But today, I wanna make a commitment to go all in with Jesus today. If that's you, would you shoot your hand in the air like that so I know to pray with you? Come on, that's awesome. Anybody else? Awesome, awesome. I see hands going up. That's great, that's awesome. Anybody else here would say, that's me. That's me today. Come on, that's awesome. That is great. Hey, we're all together. Let's all together. Let's pray in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for each and every person that's here today. God, thank you for every person that has heard this message. God, I pray in Jesus' name for people today that have never confessed you as Lord of their lives. Jesus, I pray today, Lord, that they would begin to build their lives on you. God, I thank you. You see every heart. You see every hand that went up in this room. God, you know every person's story and situation. And Lord, I pray that by the help of the Holy Spirit, they would surrender their lives to you, Jesus. Father, I pray for those people today that made a commitment and decision to turn back to you, that maybe they have once made a decision to follow you, but have turned back. God, I thank you that you are faithful, God, to welcome us back with open arms. And so, Father, we thank you for that today. And God, I pray for your church right now. God, I pray for Christians today. God, that are sitting here, I pray, Lord, that you would embolden us and empower us by the help of your Holy Spirit to share this message in spite of the pushback that we might get, in spite of opposition, in spite of whatever it takes. God, may we be people that get this message out, that share this message no matter what it costs us. God, I pray this week for people today that, God, you would interrupt their lives at the grocery store, at their work, in their neighborhood, at their sporting event. God, that you, I just pray for a Holy Spirit, divine appointments with people in our world today. God, I pray that by the help of the Holy Spirit, you would help your church, God, to boldly declare your goodness. God, thank you that even in those moments, God, you're gonna give us the words to say to people, maybe when we don't feel like we have them, but God, I pray that we would be giant billboards of your goodness and of your love. God, that people would look at us as followers of Jesus and they would see something different about us. So God, I thank you for that today. I thank you for all that you're about to do in the lives of your people. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, church, can we give God a shout of praise.